It is time to open up the Sweet 16 mailbag. Can the defense continue its strong run this tournament? Who's going to be the X Factor on Thursday? What body part would we give up for a national title? All that and a ton more. Let's have a good time. Our Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners, thank you so much for kicking off your day with us here at Locked on Spartans. That's right, your team in green and white five days a week, or if they want to keep on running towards Houston in the final four, seven days a week. Come on, you think we're ever going to stop talking about the Spartans as they keep winning? Will you be wrong? All right, before going any further, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked on. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. We're going to crack open the old trusty mailbag here. Of course, we like to do this time and time again. And what better time to do it than smack dab in the middle of the week between the Marquette game and the Kansas State game that we are now within 48 hours of. And I'm already starting to get the panic attacks going. This is great. This is fun. We live for this stuff. Um, All right. So I want to reach out for any questions locked on Spartans at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter. Sheehan underscore sports and away we Go, if I can find them, my place in my notes. All right, here we go. Rocky <laughs> writes in, what's been the difference in March? Ended the season winning games because of the three-point ball. Now we win without needing the three-pointer. Where is the ceiling now? Uh, Rocky, you nailed it. Uh, we talked up and down about how horrible the three-point shooting was over the two games against USC and Marquette. Quite frankly, didn't matter because you still won by 19 combined points anyway. So what is the difference It's as simple as, well, a few things, Uh, namely defense. Defense has been the big indicator of Michigan State winning these last two games. They entered the tournament on a five-game average, the last five games of the regular season, okay, which was fine, had its ups and its downs. Their defensive, sorry, defensive efficiency was 106. So what that means is that against an average Division I opponent, If they were to play 100 possessions, they'd give up 106 points. That's defensive efficiency. All right, that would have rated outside of the top 200. Against Marquette and USC, under 90 for defensive efficiency. That would be top five best in the country if they played like that the whole season long. Uh, Overall, Michigan State right now has boosted themselves up to 33rd best nationally defensively. And we've seen it go up. We've seen it go down throughout the entire season with Malik Hall leaving. Okay, kind of took a big dip. With him back, it's kind of risen, but he's still dealing with that back injury and namely foot injury as well. But it's just what you've been able to do on defense, and the matchup has surely helped as well. This is something we talked about on Selection Sunday is like, okay, USC – Guard predicated, their best player is Boogie Ellis, a guard. Michigan State has really good personnel when it comes to defending other guards. And, hey, you beat them. You play Marquette, led by Tyler Kolick, great point guard. But that's Michigan State's strength on defense. So it's also matchups that have played right into Michigan State's hand when you take opposing offense to Michigan State's defense as well. And you're not playing any imposing big men like a Hunter Dickinson or a Trace Jackson Davis or a Zach Eady like you would in Big Ten play. So Michigan State has gotten a break from that as well. Now, you know, just individually, what has changed? Yeah, it helps when Mati Sissoko has 10 rebounds and scores eight points for the first time since he scored 10 points in the home game against Iowa in January. So that's a roller coaster of the season. Mati Sissoko has had a lot of downs, but his ups have been game-changing ups, and they don't win that Marquette game without Mati Sissoko. And also, well, let's talk about the MVP from the weekend as well. Tyson Walker has been a big factor in this run. And not just in the last two games, though, but the whole season. And I got some numbers here that I want to go over. Um, and, well, let's just start with the most fun number from Sunday. In the last eight minutes and eight seconds in the Marquette game, Tyson Walker scored 13 points. All right, when it was time to go home, time to close things down, Tyson Walker took the keys and said, I'll lock up, fellas. All right, you guys can all leave. I I got this taken care of. But his finishing at the rim and inside the arc has been massive this whole season. 
Last year, he was a 44% finisher at the rim. All right, so like layups, really close floaters, things of that nature. 37.4% on all other twos inside the arc that aren't, you know, layups and hard finishes at the rim. This year, he's 55% at the rim. All right, he's 45.8% on all other twos. That is an 11% hike on finishes at the rim and 8% higher on all other twos. So yes, his shot making and also finishing package at the rim was a game changer for Michigan State in those last two games, but also the whole season. His improvement over last year, and he had a pretty good year last year, has been uh, just incredible. Now, to answer the second part of that question, where's the ceiling now? Final four, I, I think it's the final four. Look, Kansas State, far from an easy matchup. Um, a little surprise, Michigan State is favored in this game in Vegas. And then Tennessee, no picnic either. It's the number one defensive efficiency team in the country. But you do have the horses to beat those guys. With that said, I will not, I will not, I will not put my mind just thinking that we're going to cut nets down. Sorry, I almost short-circuited there just trying to think about it. I won't put my mind there unless, like, Bama goes down. Maybe San Diego State can help or Creighton. But, like, yeah, right now, Final Four is my ceiling. Uh, Dominic, he asked the second question. Who is the X factor for the Kansas State game? So, for this one, I wanted to go on the bench uh, because, you know, it goes without saying that uh, Jaden Akins, if he could – be a good offensive Jaden Akins. Uh, that'd be great. Look, he was a, still a net positive from last weekend. His defense was superb, but we're going to need some offense from Jaden Akins here a little bit, but I don't want to say a starter. So, and you guys already probably know that. Yeah. Malik Hall, he's going to have to be an X factor as well. Yes. He's a bench player, but he plays almost starter minutes. Um, his matchup against Keontae Johnson will be maybe the game decider, honestly, because if, Malik's on Keontae Johnson. Things aren't going well. I don't know who else you switch on to him. Jaden Akins has given up about 40 pounds and two inches to Keontae Johnson, who's an older, experienced player. So Malik calls defense. But if I really got to go deep in the bag here, it's got to be Trayvon Holloman. Um, and look, he just played five minutes last game against Marquette, just 14 possessions on the court with Trayvon Holloman. But he was a net plus five in that short stint. And Let's say that A.J. Hogard, yet again, has to go sit on the bench for the last six, seven, eight minutes of the first half because he has two fouls. And you need Trey Holloman out there just to keep the head above water, not just offensively, but especially defensively because, well, Marquise Noel, the lightning rod of a point guard for Kansas State, is a really, really really good player. So, yeah, you're going to need him offensively and defensively, even if it's just for five to seven minutes out there. I mean, let's say that the foul trouble keeps happening again because, well, this tournament seems like foul trouble is happening to almost every team if you get that officiating crew. We'll get to those guys later. But, yeah, I think it's going to be Trayvon Holloman as the X Factor, a, a thankless six-minute performance coming up for him Thursday. Who's to say? Um, oh, God, as I just dropped my pen on the ground. Uh, MSURL asks, do you think MSU can keep up this level of defense? Do you believe Madi follows up with another great performance? Madi seems to get overzealous sometimes, which leads to foul trouble or bad positioning. Do you believe he had a mental breakthrough at the end of the Marquette game? We'll hit the first part of that question first. Uh, part one, um, can they keep up this level of defense? Sure. Absolutely, sure. Uh, once again, Kansas State, another team. Not a score first big man, not, nothing that you're really going to lose a ton of sleep over in comparison to like a Zach Eady or Trace Jackson Davis. I'm not saying they don't have good big men, but again, they're more guard predicated. And also Keontae Johnson, six foot six, 230 pounds, playing that three or four position as well. You can match up well against those guys, but yes, the Keontae Johnson matchup does bother me because. Yeah, let's say it's Aikens on him while Hall catches a breather. Okay, then who is Hauser guarding? Are they going to pick apart him? So, I don't know. That does concern me. But, yeah, it's also really hard to look at what they just did against Boogie Ellis and Tyler Kolick and not maybe think that, okay, they could hold this firecracker of a man, Marquise Noel, to under 20 points. Again, it's going to be very hard to limit him. And I know I said this against Boogie Ellis and against Tyler Kolick. Marquise Noel is a different beast than those guys. It's just an athletic freak, really fast, really strong as well at just five foot eight, built stocky. It's kind of reminds me of just Darren Sproles out there uh, with a basketball. So how about that for a cross sport reference right there? So it will be hard, but yes, I do believe that 
they can continue this defense just because, well, Michigan State's strength of guard defense versus a Kansas State strength of guard offense. We've seen MSU win that battle twice over the weekend. So, hey, let's make it a third time. In part two, do I believe Madi had a mental breakthrough? I do and I don't. Um, overzealous at times, just like you said, MSU, RL, and then he can get into foul trouble or bad positioning. He did get into foul trouble against Marquette, and he did get a little overzealous. But look, he also made the right plays at the right time. However, he was 100th of a second away from that first block, being a goaltend that would have made it a three-point game. But hey, doesn't matter because he did get there on time. So he does get credit for that. And it goes to what Izzo has been kind of talking about on and off all season of Mahdi's biggest thing is just confidence. And we've seen it all across all sports. This isn't a unique situation. But once a few bad games happen, start to spiral, start to get a little uncomfortable. But that was a, a, a comfortability that we haven't seen from Mahdi in quite some time. And I really, really hope and maybe think, again, yeah, this can bode well for the next game or dare I say two games. But yeah, again, I, I don't think we're going to see a Mahdi that isn't overzealous. But luckily, it just worked out. On, on Sunday, and thank God he got to that ball at the nick of time, at the, just the right time, because, oh, that would have been very sad if they called the goaltend, which they could have, which they could have, but they didn't. All right, uh, we're going to get to a lot more questions here, guys, but first need to talk your ear off about FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook. They got a nice little prop out there. Hey, will Michigan State make the final four? Right now, our Spartans are at, are at plus 280. All right, bet $10. Profit $28. Or if you're no, if you don't think they will, well, they're minus 480 for that one. So you'd have to bet $48 to profit $10. Anyway, you want to slice it, go check it out at FanDuel. And if you're a new customer of FanDuel, well, I got good news for you. You get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 on America's number one app. That's right. That is back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win with the no sweat first bet, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use, and you get paid instantly from Mr. FanDuel. And hey, FanDuel also lets you combine your bets for a bigger chance at a payout with the same game parlay. Combine player points, player rebounds, the line of the game all together and make it rain. So do not miss the chance to get on your no sweat first bet for up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That is FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And let's get back into the mix here with our sweet 16 mailbag. Again, LockedOnSpartans at gmail.com if you ever want to reach out. Marky Mark, we're going to go to you right now. Is it possible that the Kansas State point guard, Marquise Noel, struggles with players who are more his size? Kentucky tried to guard him with a six foot four guy and couldn't stay in front, whereas West Virginia had a six foot guard and won. Now, I will say, while West Virginia did beat Kansas State, Marquise Noel still went off for 24 points, six of 12 shooting it, but, 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 but. Six turnovers, which is the knock of Marquise Noel's game. He does turn the ball over quite a bit, and so does Kansas State as a whole, really. But you are right that Kentucky didn't really fare well with putting six foot four Kassan Wallace on him for well the bulk of the second half. And some of that was good switches on Kansas State. It's almost like they were hunting for that. But other times it looks like Wallace was just marking him, being like, yeah, that's my guy. I got him. Fast forward in the possession, he never ended up having him. But yeah, it's... It's interesting because we just saw Fairly Dickinson, the shortest team in the tournament, kind of athletically and shiftily, if that's a word, probably not, but uh, get work done against Purdue. Now, I'm not stupid. I know that Zach Eady is a different position than Marquise Noel and also two feet of difference on those guys. But there is something about having lateral quickness and being just that fast twitch guy on him where I don't think Wallace had for Kentucky and maybe... Tyson Walker does have, again, Tyson Walker, I think the world of him defensively. So if that is the pairing, which you can assume that it will be, and also these are two guys that know each other as well. They played against AAU uh, in their uh, upbringing in New York. So I think it will be Tyson Walker on Marquise Noel, but we might see AJ Hogarth on him too, which that kind of concerns me. Marquise, again, he's really shifty. He's quick. Let's say AJ gets his hand out there and all right, great. we got two fouls with 11 minutes and 37 seconds left in the first half. So um, I'm spiraling now. Sorry. Let's get back to the question. Yes, I do think that a smaller guy like Tyson Walker 
does possess more strength against uh, Noel than a six foot four guy would have. I think it's all about lateral quickness and trying to make sure he doesn't shake you because all he needs is just two feet of space to get that shot. He is an aggressive shot taker. He'll take anywhere from seven to 11 threes a game. And yeah, I think he's going to be looking for that shot a lot. Um, also, all right. So Karen writes in, will we start hitting threes on Thursday and will it even matter? And then also odds of Tyson Walker dressing up as a slice of New York pizza for Tom. First part of that question, will we start hitting threes? Um, and will it matter? I, I, I think it does matter because I mean, God, just, as a fan, let's think about us for a second. I don't know if we can handle a third straight game of MSU looking like that from beyond the arc. Almost killed us on Sunday, but still figure out a way to win. But yes, I have a hard time sitting here thinking that like, yeah, they could stink up the joint from three point land for a third straight game and still have no problem winning. Like that's, that's a, that's a really narrow tight rope to start walking at that point. However, will we start hitting threes? I just numbers wise, <laughs> Numbers wise, you got to say yes, right? I mean, a, an ace can't come up every time for the dealer at the blackjack table. You, you can't be missing your threes for a whole game every time, can you? Let me knock on wood there. But look, Michigan State is a top 10 three point shooting team. They shoot at 39% on the season. And the last three games have been abysmal. The Big Ten tournament game, 18% shooting, 35% against USC, all right, which isn't terrible. But you also barely even shot any threes. I think it was just 16 or 14 three-pointers. But more importantly, out of that, you're just one for eight on threes outside of Joey Hauser. And then you fast forward to Sunday, 12.5% against Marquette. So water's got to find its level eventually. And I think it's been proven time and time throughout the year that MSU is closer to that really good three-point shooting team than they are what we've saw the last three games. I mean, you don't go a full 30 games in a season with three guys shooting above 40% on a lot of attempts just on accident. So, again, I think Michigan State, they're going to get back into the lab here. They're going to shoot with that ball that's been being used at the NCAA tournament. And, no, this isn't just me going crazy and saying this guy's blaming a ball for Michigan State shooting problems. Maybe as a whole, in the first two rounds of the tournament, teams are shooting a combined like it's 30 or 31 percent. Everyone's stinking with this ball. There have been complaints that it feels a little lighter. It feels like you're almost shooting a, a balloon off your hand. So hopefully three, four more days of shooting with that ball can help the three point shooting as well. But yeah, it's also not just been an MSU problem this tournament, but a wide problem. Now, with that said, I do have a stat that's not so fun, and that is Kansas State. Their opponents shoot 29.7% from three. That is top 20 in the country. So had to drop that nugget on you there. J-Rob uh, writes in, what are the top three things Izzo is working on drilling into the team going into Thursday? The first one, three-point shooting with those balls. All right, uh, please put up. 4,000 shots a day with those things. Anyway, on a more, actually, I was serious about that, but I was going to say on a more serious note, uh, just switching on screens and going over the screens, fighting through the screens. Um, and this is twofold. One is that at the end of the first half against USC, the bigs got lost in the switches on those very high screens, uh, almost to the point where you wondered if they even saw the guy setting the screen and rolling to begin with. So that was tough for the big man namely Mati Sissoko, but he had a really good weekend, so I don't want to be too mean. Um, also, how about just fighting over the screens, too? And what I mean by that is when they do that little chop play or they have the pick hand the ball off, you're fighting through the screen, so you're not giving that three- or two-foot cushion to the shooter. And Cam Jones, the guy from Marquette, you know, he shoots at almost the same volume from three as Marquise Noel will. He shot nine threes against Michigan State on Sunday He's a fearless shot taker. You can't give him any cushion. He made four of them, which was a pretty solid day for him. And I think Marquise Noel is going to be the same kind of guy. All he needs is just two or three feet of separation, and then that shot's going up. And a lot of times, at a 35% clip to be exact, that shot's going in from three. So I think fighting through screens is going to be drilled into the ground. And also, I wouldn't mind seeing these guys work a little more at the press break. And I know it didn't absolutely kill Michigan State completely against Marquette, but it did look a little uncomfortable at times. I mean, and that's not a special weakness. So a lot of teams look uncomfortable in the press. But look, they had the one backcourt violation. And what bothered me more is that they were getting into their sets pretty late. 
It was about like 18, 17 seconds left in the shot clock when MSU was running their motion for the first time of that possession. And then, look, I know Tyson Walker put on his, his cape and rescued Michigan State at the end of shot clocks. I don't know if I want to rely on that like for an entire 10 minute stretch of the second half again, though. So getting out of the uh, press a little cleaner would bode well for Michigan State, even if that just means you have five more seconds of running your offense instead of just waiting forever because you were almost getting suffocated at the other end of the court. Zach writes in two questions. Why is NCAA refing so terrible? All weekend long, you're saying three or four starters are all about to foul out. Seems like the whistle is so quick and ticky-tacky. Is this how the NCAA wants it to be called? Unfortunately, I think it is. I don't know how long ago the freedom of movement rules were put intact, but I, it might be like seven, eight years ago at this point, and us fans are still trying to get used to it. But it's also the inconsistencies as well. Like you watch that Tennessee Duke game, that just looked like an organized gang fight with an orange ball thrown in the middle. Like they, they weren't calling anything in that game. That was a brawl for 40 minutes. And then you watch well, Michigan state Marquette and any, any time a guy lifts his hand above his shoulder, it, it almost felt like there was a foul. So it's just the inconsistencies across the officiating crews. And I'm sure that's a byproduct of these guys coming out of conferences where games are officiated a little differently conference to conference, but yeah, any semblance of consistency would be great, and it's going to be fascinating to see what kind of a crew Michigan State gets for Thursday's game, and if they're lucky enough, Saturday's game against that really, really scrappy Tennessee team. So that might decide who moves on, actually, of how lenient of a crew will be in Madison Square Garden. Also, the second question, if I could find my spot again, that's right. Looking back, does this team still go this far? If Julius Marble is on the team, likely no Carson Cooper, and maybe maybe Mahdi doesn't develop as much. Would love your thoughts on that. It, it, the easy answer is just to say no, because we just saw what they did without Julius Marble. But it, it would have been different. Uh, Julius Marble, not really a defensive stalwart. You know, uh, he was fine. Hard stop at fine, maybe. But yeah, Michigan State, they needed just defensive big men like Mati Sissoko and Carson Cooper, guys that could run at the rim every once in a while. And it wasn't entirely Julius Marble's game, but also if we got to do a deep dive on that, then you got to go back and think, well, what games would Michigan State have won in the regular season with Julius Marble? Like, do they win that Rhode Iowa game? Probably not. Do they win that home game against Purdue? maybe I don't know but that also kind of plays into it because well if you win a few of those toss-up games then you're probably not seated a seven and what's your matchup like there so I'm just gonna take the easy way out and say no no they, they don't because we just saw what happens when guys like Mahdi guys like Carson Cooper are in the game and that's just the kind of big men that MSU needed for those last two games uh Santi Aldama fan I don't know who that is I'm gonna assume a soccer player perhaps uh for the mailbag do you think this run or whatever you want to call it raises the odds of a return of Hauser Walker and Hall um and that's a fascinating debate because you could see it as all right these guys thinking my work here is done on to the next thing verse all right I see the vision for next season and how special next year can be However, uh, Joey Hauser already said pretty much that, um, never say never, but I'm out of here. And I think that getting to the Sweet 16 and him having great games, I think, yeah, kind of slams the door on him coming back. Again, he's been in college so long that the original place he transferred from, Marquette, no longer has any coaches or players from his time there. That's how long he's been in college. Tyson Walker, I, I think he's coming back. Unless he goes absolutely nuclear and then maybe falls into like a second round of a mock draft. But again, we're talking about a six foot guard here. And NBA, unfortunately, doesn't really have an appetite for that, which makes it fortunate for Michigan State fans. So I, I think Tyson Walker, I'm going to stick with my prediction here, 90% back. Let me knock on wood there. But yeah, I just think because I, I don't think the NBA really has it for him. And then I think he could also make as much in NIL next year as he could if he wanted to go play overseas, like in Europe or the G League, for example. Um, and Malik Hall is really, God, I still think this is a coin toss. Um, I really would, I, I was hoping that like the first two games here would make me think a different way about Malik Hall, whether he's going to stay or whether he's going to go. But he he tweeted, this is so stupid, but there, there might be something to this. <laughs> he tweeted about a youth basketball camp that him, Tyson Walker, and A.J. Hogart are going to be doing this offseason. 
Now, of course, he could do that camp uh, leaving Michigan State like it's not, you know, a, con- a contractual obligation that he must be on the Michigan State team to do this youth camp. But he's going into the offseason with both those guys. And also, I, Malik, it, it's also another question of, well, where else are you going to go? And maybe, you know, his college career is just over. He has been here for a while as well. Um, it, we, we all know the story about his father uh, fighting dementia, too, for the better part of more than 10 years now. So maybe he wants to step away, spend more time with his family. But if I really had to take a pick here, 55% chance he's back. Um, and I got is that offensive rebound to seal the game, too. We talked about Mati Sissoko getting over some uh, mental hurdles earlier this show. I hope that offensive rebound really uh, is going to bode well for Malik going forward as well, just mentally speaking. So a lot on his shoulders, a lot on his shoulders, this tournament, both on offense and defense. Uh, Weddle says, not a question. It's a good start. But I uh, just have to say it would be absolutely hilarious if this was the team that won the whole thing. After all the powerhouse lineups that we've seen this past decade plus, I would cry laughing and be overly filled with joy. That's all. Hard agree on that. Um, I, I got nothing else to add. Yeah, there have been incredible Michigan State teams that have not gotten it done. But, yeah, this would be just hilarious <laughs> to, to win. I would be crying if MSU does win a national title um, just because of what it was mean for Tom Izzo and because I'm not a mentally stable adult and I put a lot of stock in this game played by children. But I would also be shedding a few tears of laughter, too, because that would be objectively hilarious, you know. No, not not the not the two seed in 2019 that had a great great run beating the best Duke team of all time. No, not the 2014 team that also had a stacked roster. No, not the 2010 team. Uh, no, how about the, just this little seven seed that looked terrible throughout the season at times, but also looked pretty good as well. Uh, Luke writes in. Here's a question. I watched the game with some family friends that don't even understand, let alone watch basketball, as he was at a play date with kids. By the end, they were pretty into it. How do you behave in this situation? I was obviously beside myself and behaving completely inappropriately, but it seemed to work. I want all my friends to become college basketball fans. I also don't want them to think I'm an insane person. you got to control the story. You have to control the narrative and get out in front of it. That's PR 101. So when I'm in a situation like this, which happens time and time again, where people don't really care about college sports at all, and I'm rooting for Michigan state as if I have 50 grand on the game when in reality, I don't have any money on it. Um, you got to get in front of the story. You just got to tell everyone guys, I'm sorry ahead of time, but I will be a basket case in the next two and a half hours. And that'll be met by laughs and you can laugh about it too, but also don't say I didn't warn you. All right. You're going to see a display of just mental illness when it comes to a relationship with a college basketball team that you never even thought existed. So get in front of the story. At least you're giving everyone a heads up. So they're not blindsided by it when you're throwing your hat on the ground before the first under 16 timeout even rolls around. Um, So that's how I handle it as well. And you just got to have fun with it too. Um, You know, hopefully everyone is rooting for your team. I have been in a situation where someone comes into the room, not caring about college sports and, Next thing you know, that they're rooting against Michigan State just to be the heel in the room. Block that person just out of your life. Don't even look at them. You could talk to them an hour after the game, maybe two, if things uh, you know, kind of simmered down. But, yeah, keep a close knit and just give everyone the heads up that you know that this is not correct behavior. But also you're not going to change. That's right. No one's ever going to change. All right, Anthony writes in, realistically, what would you give up for this team to go to Houston? I'd easily give up the possibility of the Lions doing anything under Campbell And having to start from square one, no question about it. Just even for a final four, I don't care if they lose by 80 to Alabama immediately. I I would take the Lions doing nothing for 30 more years of my life um, for a final four. Look, I've made it completely fine the first three decades of my life with the Lions being complete losers. All I need is my college sports team to do fine. So I'm sorry. I know we got a lot of Lions fans. I'm a Lions fan myself, but... They've done nothing to me for the last 30 years, so I, I could care less if they just go the next 30 years without doing anything because I want the team that's brought me happiness in my life to actually succeed, and that's Michigan State. Uh, Tigers, look, uh, I was a diehard Tiger fan, and I use the word diehard because they have stripped the joy of baseball right from me the last seven years. But, uh, yeah, I, I who cares? I, I don't care. Just 20 20- playoff list years for the Tigers as well. Uh, the Pistons are such a non-needle mover for me. Um, and the Red Wings, well, hockey is very fun, but 
I, I don't care. I, I care about Michigan State. So, yeah, I'll go a decade, two decades without any other Detroit. You know, this is what I'll say. I'll go a full decade without any Detroit playoffs for a Final Four in Houston this year. That sounds kind of crazy, but that's how much I love Michigan State. In comparison to Detroit sports, because all that Detroit sports has done is just make me miserable. In the last few years, and so we're going to reward Michigan State for actually bringing us some happiness here. So thank you, Spartans. Justin Spiro writes in. God, this is a tough one. Would you give up pizza and beer for two years if it guaranteed MSU wins the national title this year? I'm going to throw seltzer in there too, like uh, White Claw or High Noon, because I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I'll give it up. I'll just drink truly the entire – now, I'll, I'll, I'll do the – I'll just – alcohol, period. All right? Alcohol, period. We're going to throw out the window here. Pizza would actually be harder for me. Um, if you uh, follow me on Twitter, you know how much I not just love pizza, but love Little Caesars Pizza. Um, not just because of the taste. I think it tastes delightful. All right. Anyone that says it tastes like cardboard, pass me some of that cardboard because you're having some great stuff over there, but it's just the convenience and the cost of it too. Got one right over on the corner. That'd be tough to give up, but also what is food for? It, it, it's for energy. What, what is uh, alcohol sometimes used for? Um, if I could just throw on that endorsement right there, like a full fledged alcoholic, it can be used for happiness. Sometimes if you use it correctly, do you know what would give me energy? Do you know what would give me happiness in the next two years? Thinking of Michigan State's run to Houston and also just all the, the, the shirts and the hoodies and the jackets I have of the Houston Final Four logo on it, that's all the energy and happiness I need. So that's going to take me for a very, very long time. Zeke's fan page writes in, would you give up a, what, sorry, what would you give up body parts, substance, et cetera, for MSU basketball to win the natty this season? Uh, food, booze for the next two years, sure. Um, if someone walked up to me and said, MSU will cut the nets down in Houston if we could take the left pinky off your hand, I would say yes to that. Not the right hand, though, because I need it for my golf grip, and golf is very important to me. But, yeah, I think I could grip a club without a left pinky, and I would let everyone know about this, too. I'm also not going to be sheep or, you know, just coy about it, quiet about it. I'm letting everyone know that I sacrificed a digit for this team, so I also get some kickbacks, too. Um and this makes me think of like that fan poll. I think it was like a year or two ago. I think it was an SEC fan poll, uh, SEC radio or something like that put out. Would you get shot in the leg if it meant your team would win a national football title? And I think I'd get you. I, I would. Yeah, I would take that trade in a heartbeat. I remember there was a lot of responses being like, these people are crazy. What is wrong with you? And I had the same reaction. I was like, yeah, this is crazy. What's wrong with you? Of course I would do that. Absolutely I would. Provided the bullet misses the uh, femoral artery, uh, if you will. But yeah, I think I, I would take that, I think. I think I would take that. Uh, it, would, it would hurt. And I'm, I'm not a tough person when it comes to pain, but I also like national titles and it's been far too long since one has been here. Nicole writes in, what was sweeter, the Corey Lucius three for the win over Maryland to get to the Sweet 16 or seeing Tyson Walker's first in-game dunk against Marquette? It's got to be the one that, that took you to the game because, look, Tyson Walker, that was an awesome dunk, his first ever in-game dunk. MSU still wins the game without that. It was just a nice sigh of relief, a good exclamation point, whereas Corey Lucius, that rims out. Um, mm, well, we're not talking about one of Izzo's eight Final Fours. Uh, so Matt writes in, if, oh boy, if Rick Carlisle wanted to coach at MSU tomorrow, would Alan Haller fire Izzo? Absolutely, 100%. Rick Carlisle Get in the bus. We're going to Madison Square Garden. That is an inside reference that maybe 16 people would understand. Uh, but, yeah, you always got to take Rick Carlisle over Tom Izzo, especially in the middle of a 15th trip to the Sweet 16. Jason writes in, 2014 Elite 8 team or 2016 incident team? Jason, the vibes were great. Why are we doing this? Uh, I would take the... I would take the 2014 Elite Eight team. That will always be the one that got away from me. Not not the 2010 Final Four team. Not the uh, uh, 2019 team. No, the, the 2014 Elite Eight team will always be the the shot at title number two that got away. Justin Thin writes in favorite movie you've seen the last three years. I've only watched one new movie the last three years, and I'm using new very very loosely. Goodfellas watched it on a plane on the way down to a bachelor party. I would have watched another movie on the way back, but I used all my energy and resources just trying to hang on to survival on that flight back after that long weekend. And Chopman, he writes in, choose your fighter, suit Izzo or Christmas sweater Izzo? 
I gotta go suit Izzo. I gotta go suit Izzo. Let, let's suit up. Let's uh, let's go and do Thursday seriously here. And hope you enjoyed this journey that we've been taking this episode, guys. We will be back tomorrow. We're gonna be talking with someone from the K State side of things, and then still working on a few guests here. But hey, until then, love you all. Go green. <laughs>